Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. As a law enforcement officer, my commitment to truth and integrity is unwavering. I have no reason to fabricate or exaggerate what I witnessed, and quite frankly, I couldn't care less if anyone believes me. Throughout my career, I've come across stories and rumors of strange phenomena, but I never paid them much attention. It's not that I didn't believe, but rather I adopted a seeing-is-believing approach. It happened on a sweltering evening just after or before Labor Day in 2007. The darkness had descended roughly around 8.30 or 9 p.m. Although the western sky still retained a faint glimmer characteristic for that time of year, I was on patrol, driving westbound on Highway 128, leaving Cloverdale behind, responding to a routine alarm call at a ranch property. Such calls were commonplace in my line of work. As a law enforcement officer, you develop an acute awareness of your surroundings. You notice things that are out of place. A car parked where it wasn't the day before. A person walking along a desolate road. Light emanating from a closed building. These details catch your eye, often escaping the notice of ordinary passers-by. And so, as I was driving westbound, something caught my attention. A figure emerged from the ravine and stepped onto the roadside. I can't quite describe it, but I caught a glimpse of movement amidst the brush and instantly knew it was a person. People frequently try to evade us, so my initial thought was that I had startled someone who might be cultivating marijuana in the woods. A common occurrence in these parts. I could discern the outline of a body, and as my headlights reflected off its eyes, it swiftly retreated into the undergrowth before I could pass by. Believing it to be someone, attempting to avoid detection, I slammed on the brakes and promptly reversed my vehicle. That's when I witnessed it in the beams of my headlights, standing at a height of approximately six to seven feet. It possessed a thick, matted coat of brown fur and walked upright. Although I didn't catch a glimpse of its face as it was facing away from me, the sight left me dumbfounded. Just like everyone else who has had a similar encounter, I couldn't believe my eyes. It was certainly not something I was willing to relay over the radio. There were dense branches and overgrown foliage obstructing my view but there was no mistaking what I had witnessed. Two details remain etched vividly in my memory. Firstly, the creature had small leaves and grass entwined within its fur all over its back. I observed this as it slowly walked away from me. The image remained seared into my mind. Secondly, I distinctly remember its deliberate and unhurried movements. It proceeded with calculated steps using its arms to brush aside small branches and twigs obstructing its path. I had the creature in my line of sight from the rear for a significant four to five seconds before it vanished once again into the thick vegetation. I found myself stepping out of my car, standing there in silence for approximately two to three minutes with the engine turned off. I could hear the same measured movements the unmistakable crunch of leaves and twigs echoing from the depths below. It seemed to be making its way toward the nearby creek area. Each time, the sounds ceased, and I contemplated returning to my vehicle. A distant crunch would reach my ears, compelling me to linger a little longer, listening intently. The ravine harbored a creek, and it was evident that the creature had retreated back to the secluded enclave. Needless to say, I kept my encounter to myself, 
It was not a matter to be discussed during briefings or recorded on the patrol blotter. Sharing such an experience would undoubtedly have made for an uncomfortable and challenging career. I toyed with the idea of reaching out to one of our fish and game officers, but considering that he was acquainted with many of my colleagues, I decided to maintain my silence. Reading the account of others on various forms reassures me that I'm not alone. While I've never encountered a ghost, UFO, or anything of that nature, this experience has opened my eyes to the possibilities that lie beyond the realm of our everyday understanding. It begs the question of what else is out there lurking just beyond the boundaries of our laughter and skepticism. On to the next one. I grew up in the Ohio countryside south of Columbus. My childhood was good. My parents were nice, and I never wanted for anything. Okay, I lie. I always wanted a Stretch Armstrong, but never got one. While my childhood wasn't full of drama or anything too remarkable, what I'm about to tell you is, you see, I'm convinced we had a Sasquatch that would pass through the area on a regular basis. This belief is due to seeing them now and then, as well as other evidence. My life with Sasquatch began when my parents and I moved into a house that was only a couple of hundred yards from an abandoned railroad bed. I was 10 years old at the time, but I have a very distinct memory of this time of my life. It wasn't long after we, my friends and I, started our forays to the railroad bed. During the summer months, the weeds would grow taller than we were. For us, it was akin to being in a forest. Each summer, we'd carve a path through, using sticks to hack and slash at the weeds, cutting out a narrow, curving path and a larger open area where we'd gather to talk and whatnot. When the Sasquatch first turned up, or should I say, when we first noticed it, we were still young. We had no idea what was there. We felt that something was there on occasion watching us, but for a long time, we saw nothing. Then one of my friends reported seeing something large and hairy one night. He saw it from a distance, and only briefly. The rest of us didn't take him too seriously at first, but he insisted and kept hounding us about what he saw. It wasn't long after that sighting, another friend, a girl whose grandparents lived in the lot adjoining the railroad bed, saw something one night. She mostly lived with her grandparents due to family issues, and her bedroom window looked right out at the old railroad bed. Having a second report of something large and hairy up there at night made us all take it more seriously. Still, we were young and stupid and the railroad bed was our place to go to get away from our parents. It was our place. We weren't going to give it up easily. Being so young still, we had no idea what it really was. So without any knowledge of a Bigfoot or Sasquatch, we started calling it a troll. Since it was never seen often, we decided to live with it. Note, it's been suggested to me before, upon sharing these events, that a Sasquatch may have been young itself. I don't know. Several years went by, and we were easily into our early teens. That's when things started to pick up. Maybe the thing was a juvenile. Maybe it was just watching us grow, and decided that while it was willing to allow young children to play there, it wasn't going to be so tolerant of older children. The girl who lived right next to the railroad bed had several more nighttime sightings. She was so afraid of what she saw that she convinced herself that she dreamed these rather than truly admit that there was something there. I had three sightings of it or them over the years. She was with me for the first one. We were in her grandparents' yard, walking up the short, gentle hill to the railroad bed, She froze and put her arm across my chest, stopping me. I looked at her. She was staring, open-mouthed and wide-eyed, pointing straight ahead. 
through a narrow gap in the weeds, I saw what looked like the head and shoulders of a large humanoid figure with dark black hair. It was either sitting or crouched, holding perfectly still. We were seeing its profile. We backed slowly down the hill until it was out of sight, then turned and ran. After that, she refused to ever go back up there, not even as part of a group. The following day, we told another friend who wanted to see the spot. It was broad daylight, so I took him there, albeit reluctantly. The only sign we saw of it was a large patch of flattened grass where it had been. Somewhere in there, he and I also found what we referred to as the vine cave, which I now believe to have been a nest. From our point of view, it simply popped into existence, literally overnight in the large open area we carved. He and I crawled into it a few times, but it was always very uncomfortable and we always slept quickly. Not long after the discovery of the vine cave, a couple of rival kids destroyed it, thinking we'd built it. I think that may well have caused the increase in encounters with the Sasquatch and its attempts to chase us away. My second and third sightings were spaced out over the next few years. Each time I saw it, it was in broad daylight. I was in our driveway pulling weeds that were growing up through the gravel. Movement from up the railroad bed caught my attention. I looked up there to see a tall, humanoid being with long arms walking along the hill, moving to my right. It was covered in dark black hair. I've always suspected it was the same creature I saw on my first sighting, but I don't know for sure. I watched it walk for a few seconds until it was blocked from view by a neighbor's storage shed. Then I turned and ran into the house. I didn't go back up to the railroad bed for weeks. My third sighting was from a far greater distance. On the other side of the railroad bed was a fenced-in area of cow pasture and the local water tower. Beyond that was a trailer court. I was in our upstairs back bedroom one afternoon, again during broad daylight. I saw what I first took to be a rolled up rug by a trash can back in the trailer court. I could just barely see it due to the distance. I looked away and then looked back. What I was seeing seemed shorter, as if it had been sagged or crouched. I kept looking away and then looked back, wanting to see if it moved. I couldn't tell if it was moving or not. Finally, I looked away for about 10 minutes. When I looked back, whatever had been there was gone. Another friend of mine lived in a house just beyond the far side of the trailer court. A wooden privacy fence divided his backyard from the trailer court. He once told me that he and his family would sometimes smell a heavy, musky scent at night, as well as hear heavy footfalls outside their house during those same late night hours. He said his mother even claimed to have heard a loud heartbeat on occasion. All in all, we were lucky. We gave it plenty of incentive to lash out at us, and it never did anything to hurt us. It did seem to understand that fear could be used as a tactic and deployed that to scare us. We were just too dumb and stubborn to pay close enough attention, even after we'd all seen it. Aside from the direct sightings of the creatures, we had other evidence that it was there as well. Once, when I was in my teens and at the railroad bed alone, something that sounded very large was in the weeds and brush ahead of me, thrashing at the weeds, causing them to move and make a lot of noise. I thought at first it was the same friend who wanted to go check out the site of my first direct sighting of the Sasquatch. About the same moment, I realized that whatever was ahead of me was too large to be him. A rock about the size of my fist was thrown at me, just narrowly missing my head. I ran and refused to go back to the railroad bed for weeks after. The next time, I was there alone. I was in the same place and the same weed thrashing occurred again. 
Luckily, no rock was thrown that time. Another time, that same friend who wanted to see the spot of my first sighting and I were at the railroad bed by herself. There had to have been, at the very least, two of the creatures with us, one on either side of us. Nothing was thrown at us, but the same weed thrashing noises started up to each side of us. Oddly, this time nothing was moving, that we could see. Both of us clearly heard the sounds, but couldn't see a thing moving. Still, after holding our ground for only a few moments, we both ran. This same friend also decided to step up our own claims on the railroad bed after he found a rock cairn built on our path one day. The cairn was small. My friend spouted his usual line of no monkey is going to chase me away and promptly kicked the cairn, scattering the stones. We gathered up new stones and built a new, larger cairn in place of the one we'd found. We left. We went back the next day to find our own cairn scattered and a new, larger one in its place. My friend immediately kicked it apart and we built a new one, larger still, in place of the one we'd found. This went on for days. Each day, we'd find that the cairn we'd built the day before had been wrecked and a new, larger one would be in its place. Each day, my friend would scatter the new one and we'd build her own, larger yet, in place of the most recent one we'd found. Secretly, I thought he was going back up to the railroad bed later and building the new cairn we would find the next day, and he thought the same of me. Finally, after this had gone on long enough that the Karens were getting to be a bit larger than shoebox size, my friend decided to go one better and sent Mark the Karen we just built. He told me what he was going to do and promptly unzipped his pants and urinated on the rock Karen we had just built. Afterward, we left and went to his house. We hung out on his front porch for two or three hours, talking, then decided to go check on the new scent marked Karen. The scent hit us when we were still a good hundred yards, maybe more, from the Karen. We knew what we'd find, and it scared both of us. As we'd been together for the entire intervening time, we knew that the other had not gone back to the railroad bed to do anything. The scent was an overpowering musk that was so strong it made us sick. Think skunk concentrate. We held our breath, ran in, saw what we knew we'd find, a new Karen that was noticeably larger than the one we'd built a few hours prior and ran back out into clear air to breathe. That stench lingered for days, but that ended the rock Karen war. There were other times, before and after that, when my friends and I would be at the railroad bed and smell what smelled like a skunk. We also once found what looked to be shallow, crude pit toilets. We saw what looked to be finger marks in the mud and suspected they'd been dug out with very large bare hands. Several of the toilets contained what looked to be human fecal matter, only far larger. The next-door neighbors we had while I was growing up were very wasteful people. They didn't believe in leftovers from meals. If something wasn't eaten, it went into the trash, not the refrigerator. Their trash was torn open many times. They went to the expense of having a five-foot-tall brick wall built around the area they kept their trash cans in. There was a green picket gate on the front for the garbage collectors to open to get access to the trash. They also bought trash cans with locking lids. None of it did any good. Whatever kept tearing into the trash would sometimes open the gate, leaving it open, and knew how to unlock the locked trash can lids. I have often wondered if their trash wasn't why the Sasquatch liked that area, and if it wasn't using the railroad bed as a convenient staging place to raid both their trash and trash from the aforementioned trailer court. I've no evidence to support these claims. It's just a theory. We were young and never thought to gather any evidence, something I kick myself to this day over.
having a Sasquatch passing through so closely, so often, didn't seem special to us because we were growing up with it. On to the next one. While camping in the Santa Fe National Forest in northern New Mexico, I experienced a most peculiar visitation. I was 30 years old at the time and a trade school student in Albuquerque in machine drafting. I was part of a study group from the Southwest Indian Polytechnic Institute in Albuquerque. We were camping fairly high up in the mountains and hills on an alcohol-free student activity prior to the end of the school year. Our student advisor was a Mr. Ray Petiamo from the Pueblo of Acoma, New Mexico. Early that morning, at around 4 a.m., I was asleep in my own tent alone when I was actually awakened by an awful stench. This foul odor was so powerful, the scent actually burnt my nostrils. I sat up in my sleeping bag just in time to see a massive brown, hairy arm reach into the tent through the front flap and start to feel around. Totally horrified, I started to hyperventilate as this huge arm clearly was not human. Just as I was about to scream my lungs out, the arm drew back and out of the tent. I was strangely aware then that there were two creatures right outside of my tent as I heard two separate and distinct vocalizations, one male and one female. Through the dim outside light and through the tent material, I could make out at least two figures probably eight feet in height. The next thing I heard were these two beings yelling loudly as they apparently ran away from my tent. I stayed awake until sunrise and was so enthralled by what had happened that I could not bring myself to tell anyone about this event. At breakfast, no one else there was talking about any similar occurrence. I have never told anyone about this until earlier this year. I have never returned to that area. It was around 4 a.m. with dim light outside, close to where I was. Overcast, visibility was poor. The area is hilly and mountainous in northern New Mexico, forested and fairly isolated. On to the next one. Truck drivers passing along a lonely stretch of road in Taos County, New Mexico, reported seeing a huge hairy creature with red eyes. It was not a bear, and it was reported as monkey-like. Locals said it had been in the area for years. On to the next one. Me and a distant cousin of mine had something strange happen to us near Mescalero, New Mexico. It was very early in the morning, maybe just after sunrise. We had to be at work at the Inn of the Mountain God, the casino and golf resort in the Balascara Reservation. No one wanted to give us a ride to work, so we decided to walk the main highway and hitchhike to work. This is where my father lived. From my father's house to the paved road, it is a distance of about maybe half a mile. We finally got to the paved road and maybe walked another quarter of a mile when we started hearing noises from across the road at the tree line. Prior to this, I can't remember when. I had heard something similar when I had gone outside to hang clothes. It was just before sunset, and I heard something scream. It scared the living daylight out of me, and I just ran inside. I had been home alone and couldn't wait for my father to come home so I could tell him. When I did finally tell him, he told me it was probably an elk bugling, which I didn't believe for one minute because this thing was very high-pitched. Anyway, I was telling a friend about this incident. That it kind of sounded like the time I heard something before. All I know is that it really scared us. I have walked that road before, even at night by myself, and I have never been scared like that. We also noticed that, whatever it was, it sounded like it was following us along the tree line, because when we stopped, it stopped. And at one point, we started running. It seemed to run along with us. That's when we really got scared because we could hear the branches snapping. We didn't know what to do because we were too scared, and there wasn't really any houses nearby to run to, so we were half walking, running, trying to decide if we should go back to my dad's or just keep going when a truck came from behind. 
We waved those people down and jumped in. I don't think we even waited for them to ask us if we wanted a ride. I don't know what that thing could have been. All I know is that it was making some really scary noises. It seemed to be following us. Maybe a couple of weeks before this, I had heard a weird scream coming from a distance while I was outside hanging clothes. This scared me so bad that I just went inside and didn't bother to hang the clothes. The reason I was so scared when me and my cousin were walking was because this sounded very similar. This happened early in the morning. I think maybe between 6 and 7 a.m. It is all forest in this area, except for the paved road that goes between two ridges. You hear stories now and then about Bigfoot in the area. My dad has heard stories. I know when my children go visit him, he rarely ever lets them play outside. He says it's because of bears, but I think it's something else. He just doesn't want to say. On to the next one. I found Sasquatch sightings online, and I was astonished when I started reading some of them. They reminded me of a situation that my friend Edgar and I experienced one night we were camping in Cloudcroft, New Mexico. It was in the summer. Edgar and I had pitched a tent. At about one in the morning, we were awakened by a scream that was coming from far away. The sound kept getting closer and closer. We kept trying to figure out what animal was making the noise. We were too scared to look out, so we just stayed very quiet inside the tent. We could tell that the animal was looking for food because it was making stops at each of the camping spots. It sounded awful. It was like a screaming baby or a screaming woman. In between each scream, you could also hear some grunt. Eventually, it reached our camping spot. We could hear that it was looking around and it left. It continued screaming until it faded in the distance. The following morning, we asked the camp manager if he had heard anything during the night. He said no. When we told him what we had heard, he dismissed it as a cougar. Since we are not experienced campers, we believed him and left it as that until I heard the recordings of Bigfoot online. The sounds are almost identical to those on the recording. The recordings are from far away. We heard it within a few feet, but they sounded the same. There were two witnesses, Edgar and myself. We were both sleeping inside our tent. It was about 1 a.m. It was a clear night. No lights were in the area. There was a fire pit with some embers still burning. On to the next one. In the Four Corners area of New Mexico and Colorado in San Juan County in New Mexico, a large something walks along the San Juan River. It goes on the Navajo Reservation. It has been seen by our local sheriff. It is a large, brownish, red, hairy thing. It stinks to high heaven and makes some god-awful noises. We usually know it's outside when the dogs start howling. We live about eighth of a mile from the river. It usually shows up every three to five years. We don't go down to the river as everyone knows it's down there. I also heard something messing around in the shed. I went out there and this thing was in there looking around. It was about seven foot tall or larger. Russian olive forest follows the river. The river comes from Colorado. We live in the high desert plateau region. On to the next one. The following is a collection of wild man sightings from the turn of the century which share remarkable similarities to modern-day Bigfoot and Sasquatch sightings. People living in the neighborhood of Devil Canyon are greatly agitated over the appearance there of a wild man. This fellow lives in the brush along the side of the canyon and apparently subsists on roots and herbs. He is described as a middle-aged man with long hair and only half-dressed. So far, he has attempted no harm, but by his strange actions and loud screaming has badly frightened several farmers' wives living in the locality. In Marysville, a wild man of giant stature is roaming over the mountainous regions about Blue Tent, frightening the inhabitants of the section. He wears no clothing. 
Many carcasses of bears and deer have been found lying about, each showing signs of having been more or less eaten into, evidently for food. The man's resting place is thought to be a cave difficult of access and never entered by others. So far is as known because of the great number of rattlesnakes that infest it. Marysville, December 25th. A wild man is roaming the mountains in the neighborhood of Bullard's Bar in this county, and the residents are terrorized. Constable Owens was directed by the sheriff over the telephone to capture the fellow if possible and is now off on that mission. Both the constables of the Pasadena Township have been asked to be on the lookout for an alleged wild man who has been seen in the vicinity of Giddings Ranch toward the mouth of Millard Canyon. According to reports, a stranger with long flowing locks is inhabiting the wilds of the vicinity, coming out of his haunt only rarely, and when seen, runs swiftly to cover. Officials of Northern Pasadena Water Company scout the rumor that the wild man has contaminated their water supply by bathing therein. But E.W. Giddings, owner of the Giddings Ranch, naturally does not relish a wild man about his preserve. Ranchers in the San Gabriel Valley slept with one eye open last night, ready to jump at the first squeal of a chicken. The wild man of San Dimas Canyon has escaped from the mountains and taken to the valley. Whoever this individual may be has for a week terrorized the camps in the mountains of that district. He is a man with an abnormal appetite. If he finds campers away, he loots the camp's provisions yet a short time afterward, seems to be as hungry as ever. Now that he is taken to the valley, it is a question as to what his hunger will drive him to take. Constables in every township are looking for him, and he will be arrested at the first opportunity. It is thought that he is insane. The man is ragged and unkempt, and has three fingers missing from one hand. Residents of Miramar, a resident suburb east of the city, are greatly excited about a supposed wild man roaming in the vicinity. Yesterday afternoon, Mrs. Dr. W. Harrison Jones, wife of the city health officer, looking out of her rear window of a residence, saw a tattered and ragged fellow come up the road carrying a live squirrel in each hand. He looked about stupidly, then ran into the next yard, seated himself on the grass, killed the squirrel, and then devoured the raw flesh. Having gorged himself, he hid away the remainder of the animals and disappeared toward the beach. The officers are looking for the man, wondering what sort of demon fiend he is possessed of, and also where he got the live squirrel. The Pajororian of Saturday says that a wild man is reported to be infesting the neighborhood of Spreckles Quarry. It is believed that he sleeps in a cave nearby, from which he emerges at night for the purpose of raiding the cook's house of Matthew's cattle ranch. Matthew caught him in the act the other night and sprinkled him with birdshot, but he made his escape. The man who is described as being ragged and dirty is thought to be an escaped lunatic. The people down toward Reclamation have been terrorized in the past two weeks by an alleged wild man who is probably a lunatic. In fact, he is thought to be an escapee from an asylum. He hides in the tool at day, coming out at night, and subsisting on sour milk taken from the hog's throats of the nearby dairies. The man is said to be six feet tall, and when pursued, rushes through the sloughs, ditches, and over fences. Nobody has been able to get very close to him. The residents down that way are afraid to venture forth at night. But thus far, no damage has been done to and property or harm any person. Deputy Sheriff R. L. Ramison went down on Wednesday to look for the man, but could not locate him. One day last week, Della Maria, who conducts the Rose Ranch, saw the wild man who had been terrorizing residents of that place. The man was in the cow barn near the dairy, and when the owner of the ranch approached, he made his exit. 
he ran over into the hills and escaped. Deputy Sheriff Ramathan and Constable J.B. Sullivan were summoned to the Conway Ranch near the city today to try and capture a wild man who is at large in that locality. The man frightened the residents by his queer action. He is a big, tall fellow, wears dark clothes and a dark hat. He is supposed to be the same one who was seen near the city last week. Arthur Matson and the Conway brothers searched all day on horseback to try to find the man, but he evades them. A wild woman coming from no one knows where and dwelling in what cryptic cavern on the island fastness none may guess is the latest most exciting sensation in Catalina. According to the boatmen and others who frequently make trips into various inlets and retreats of the Magic Isle, the woman is never seen before sunset, and no one has been able to get close enough to her to form any well-defined concept of her appearance, except to note that she is almost nude. The wild woman has been seen by a number of islanders if their stories are to be believed, and all who claim to have seen her pronounce her exceptionally wild and of powerful Amazonian proportions. Her hair, according to common report, is long and entirely unbound, flowing in spectral tresses over her bare shoulders and down her waist. Her skin is said to be tanned, but her natural complexion, according to several whose claim suddenly to have run across her in some of the canyons, is that of Anglo-Saxon. She is described as beautiful but timid as a fawn. About three months ago, rumor has it, she was seen for the first time in a ravine not far from White's Landing. She appeared going over the brow of the hill, on the apex of which she paused a while and stood gazing over the sea and leaning against a tree. About a month ago, the wild woman was seen in the vicinity of the Isthmus, and several boys spent nearly a day looking for her rendezvous but with no avail. The wild woman completely eludes all followers and is as nimble as a goat when it comes to running up and down hills. At first, the story of her presence on the island was discredited, but in the last few days, tourists have returned to Avalon from hunting trips and verified the report. They claim to have seen her in section of the island widely apart, indicating that she is a great traveler. There has been some talk in Avalon of organizing a search party to go after the woman and run her down. A number of men have volunteered, but the women here think she ought to be left alone. On to the next one. In Ocean County, in New Jersey, at dusk, a couple had a row, and the wife stormed out of the house and sat in her car to cool off. As she sat there, she heard the door being rattled and turned to see a weird creature trying to get into her car with her. The woman screamed in terror quickly, locking all of the doors. Hearing her cry, the husband ran out of the house with a gun, but before he could complete a shot, the creature with a limping gait ran off into the woods. The distraught couple described it as black, large glowing eyes and stood about four and a half feet tall. It seemed to move about in a crouched position. On to the next one. Near Indian Mills in Burlington County in New Jersey, Charles Romano and Joe Hartman were bow hunting for deer off Jackson Road. Hartman wanted to use a deer call, but Romano did not want him to do it because he thought it might spook them. Romano went up to a deer stand whilst Hartman went off. A short time later, Romano spotted something coming up a rise to his right and walking from left to right. It was still light and Romano heard a strange sound coming from it. Romano was breathing hard and shaking. The animal had reddish hair all over and walked upright with short, quick steps. It was five feet tall and walked off. After this, Romano went back to his car. Hartman saw nothing, but had heard strange sounds. On to the next one. Near the Mulica River, there was an extraordinary mangling of dogs and livestock. On the paltry farm of Steve Silcotch, 31 ducks, 3 geese, 
four cats, and two large dogs, including a 90-pound German Shepherd whose thick collar was chewed to pieces and his body was dragged a quarter of a mile from the scene of the attack. A state trooper saw the creature taking livestock and found giant footprints. On to the next one. A girl and her friends were parked in a car in the Morristown Historical Park when a hairy humanoid attacked the witness's car by thumping on its roof. On to the next one. Raymond Todd and three friends were parked in a car in the Morristown Historical Park when they saw a seven-foot-tall, faceless entity ambling across the lawn. The creature had huge shoulders and was black and hairy and was walking erect, though with a stiff, rocking motion. It was not a bear. The four witnesses drove to the park entrance where they warned people about a monster lurking inside. Raymond Todd was one of the witnesses, caught a ride with a young lady who told him she'd encountered the same monster the previous year in the same area when she and several friends were in a car parked in that area late at night. The huge, broad-shouldered something had loomed up in the rear window and thumped on the back of their car. This particular hominoid has been seen a lot where it was surprising courting couples in Lover's Lane. Some researchers speculate that these monsters are attracted by the scent produced by courting couples and menstruating women. On to the next one. In Allery State Park, near Atlantic Avenue in Neptune in Mammoth County in New Jersey, I was 16. Four buds and I were out cruising. All of us surfers, no booze, no drugs. It was a clear night. We ended up at the Allery State Park in New Jersey. I had no idea where we were. We heard something screech. We turned around to make a quick three-point turn and we hit a ditch. The headlights were on a reddish-brown, really, really tall, eight to nine feet, big man thing. I had never heard of Bigfoot. Years later, I realized what it was. Even now, writing this, I get goosebumps. I will never forget this. He scared the crap out of all of us. There was a screeching, high pitch before we made the turn. We were all teen, 15 to 17. It was 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. in a pine forest. On to the next one. At Lower Bank in Burlington County, New Jersey, in October, a married couple found footprints 17 inches long outside their house. They also saw a hairy face peering in through a window that was seven feet up. The witnesses regularly left vegetable scraps out for it, which it ate. One night, they left nothing. It could have been annoyed, for it threw the dustbins against the wall. A gunshot fired into the air did not deter it, so the male fired at it. It ran away and did not return. On to the next one. A group of campers in a pickup truck were passing a blueberry field near Belhaven Lake in Atlantic County near Egg Harbor when they heard a high-pitched scream. A high-pitched, cracking scream with a recurring pattern. A few of the cries were muffled, as if intermittently choked off. After the driver stopped the truck, they saw something thrashing about in the blueberry bushes. Even though it was broad daylight, they could only make out a dark outline. On to the next one. Me and another person were sitting in a car on Service Avenue in North Brunswick, New Jersey. I was 15 years old at the time and had just come home from a night out. We were parked on the right-hand side of the dead-end side of the block. There are two houses on the right side of the street, then there is Woods, and then Lawrence Brook. The moonlight was shining from behind the car towards the brook. While talking, I glanced up towards the brook when I saw two red eyes in the middle of the road, about 35 to 40 feet away. I immediately said, what is that thing on the road? The driver 
turned its headlights on, and that is when we could see that this thing was not a dog, a person, or a bear. This thing was hunched down on the ground, and from the ground to the top of its head, it looked to be three and a half feet tall. After the headlights were turned on, it sat there for about 30 seconds. We saw that it was hairy with three to four inch length reddish brown hair, and while standing, it was about five feet tall. After 30 seconds, it stood up, turned around, and sort of waddled into the woods at a snail's pace. I guess it was ticked off by the headlights. Good thing, because we were scared and locked our doors. Once it went into the woods, I exited the car and ran into the house. The driver threw the car into reverse, backed out into Nassau Street, threw the car into gear, and sped off down Livingston Avenue. After I went inside my house, I told my mother, whose answer was it must have been a dog or a bear, and thought nothing of it. This was a one-time occurrence, and I have not seen anything like it since, but I did hear other things when I lived there. I played in those woods and the brook as a child, and noticed some very odd structures made of thorns. One time back there, I and another child were followed by something. We had no clue as to what it was, but it scared us, and we left the wood fast. At 9.30 p.m., it was dusk. It was very warm and a clear night. Lawrence Brook runs through multiple towns in Middlesex County. The area has a small area of wood which surrounds it. There are also very large storm drains, about five feet in diameter in the area as well. On to the next one. Near Milford in Hunter Don County in New Jersey. This story goes back many years. It has always been a bit of a joke in my family, but there isn't one person who doesn't believe that I saw something that day. I was a young girl, about nine or ten years of age, and we used to stay at my uncle's house in western Jersey. I don't know if anything has ever been sighted there, but I saw something. He lived very far west, and at the time, there was a great deal of woods around his house. I don't know where the nearest neighbor was. Anyway, one morning, I took a walk into the woods looking for my brothers as I thought they were down by the stream. As I walked deeper into the woods and near the stream, I heard lots of noise coming from the other side of the stream out of my sight. I thought it was my brothers trying to scare me, so I called out to them and threatened to tell mom if they didn't stop. Still no answer. That's when I became really frightened. If you've ever met my mother, you would know what I mean. I came off the path to the stream and hid behind some bushes on the side. That's when I saw it coming down the stream, walking on its hind leg like a man. It appeared to be very big and covered completely in dark, long hair. I thought maybe it was a bear, but the face was not like a bear at all. I never saw anything like it before. It stopped in front of me and looked directly at me. Being the brave soul I am, I closed my eyes, held my breath, and waited for it to kill me or leave. I was so scared, either one would have just been fine with me because I could not move. But thankfully, it left and just walked away. I heard it leave, walking in the same direction it was going. When I could finally stand again, I ran up the hill crying. I was so frightened that we had to leave my uncle's house and stay in a hotel the rest of our visit there, not to mention every visit thereafter. On to the next one. One subject of animal mimicry deserves special attention. By far, the most commonly reported imitative Bigfoot vocals are bird calls. Testimony from First Nation informants closely associate bird calls with Bigfoot in the lore of certain tribes. A July 15, 1924 newspaper article titled The Pacific Northwest's Theatic Speak Not Only the Bear Language of the Kalalum Tribe, but also the Bird Language. The Thetic Tribe can imitate any bird of the Northwest, especially the Blue Jay. Henry Moon, a guide of mixed Modoc and Paiute ancestry, told researcher Bobby Short he had heard yayas while bear hunting. Sometimes it sounded like a bird call, 
Other times, it sounded like a two-finger mouth whistle. For the Gwich'in of the Yukon Territory, there is little more frightening than hearing a hairy giant. What squared the Gwich'in the most? Hearing a whistle. Even when friends whistled, they stopped everything. To them, it is the call of the hairy giant to a female. The First Nations also listened to the alarm call of birds and what each alarm call indicated. One bird in their territory is capable of mimicking at least 40 other birds. It's the gray catbird. It also mimics the bushman or other hairy giants and vice versa. Again, this trend expresses itself worldwide. In Guarani myth, the South American Churupira is a short creature with a large head like a chimpanzee, covered in reddish hair and known for its bird-like whistles. Malaysians describe the call of their man-like, hairy, hantu skiai as akin to a bird. Yahoo, an aboriginal term for the Australian Yowie, is a name synonymous among tribes in Victoria's snowy mountains with the gray count babbler, a songbird. The leshy was especially covetous of this ability. Don't whistle in the home or in the word, Slavic lore holds. It's only the leshy who whistles. As indigenous lore goes, so go sightings. In 1967, Illinois, Immediately prior to a harrowing Bigfoot encounter in Chicago, a witness in Schiller Woods hears a bird whistle, some type of exotic bird I never heard before. The call happens at least four more times, is also noted by a passing couple. From 1996 to 2002, Virginia. A variety of dramatic incidents occur at a farmhouse near the North Carolina border over the course of six years, including missing farm animals, house knocks, full-bodied sightings of Bigfoot, and vocalizations. The witness hears growls, roars, and a host of vocal mimicry one night she awakens to a front yard full of birds chirping so loudly they woke me up at 2 a.m. As the group flock moves through the pasture, and into the forest, chirping all along the way. No human could copy this. 2008, Texas. A man bought a large shape, belly crawling through tall grass, and shouts, Oh, for heaven's sake, I see you. The shape freezes and crawls out of sight backward. Simultaneously, he hears vocalizations from the tree line including a bird-like whistle so loud it made your eardrums vibrate, so you knew it was no bird on the face of the earth. 2010, Washington. On September 25th, a Skamania County couple notices their dog seems anxious. The same night, they smell a skunky odor outside and hear three distinct and loud animal calls like whoops. They later tell BFRO it sounded like a person trying to imitate a bird call. I have never heard a sound like this ever in my life, and I am familiar with several Pacific Northwest animal sounds. It is interesting that the world's most skilled vocal mimic, the parrot, is a bird. Perhaps the shared affinity for imitation between parrot and Bigfoot provides a clue to the latter's brain structure. In 2015, scientists discovered the first hints how to parrot mimic sound so well. Any bird that the vocal learner has part of the brain devoted to this, called the song system, wrote journalist Ashley P. Taylor for the Audubon Society. But in parrots, the song system has two layers, an inner core common to all avian vocal learners and an outer shell, which is unique to parrots. Researchers suspect this shell is key to facilitating parrot mimicry. Witnesses occasionally identify specific types of bird calls alleged encounters have described rooster crows, partridge calls, woodpecker knocks, crow calls, and loon cries, each attributed to Bigfoot on account of their vocal quality or proximity to.
two large, hairy hominid activity. On the 12th of April, 2005, I went to my local state park, wrote Courtney. As I was sitting on a log near a large thicket, I heard what I thought was wild turkeys clucking. When I turned around to investigate, the sounds stopped. I heard a loud wood knock coming from the top of the hill. On to the next one. Near Mountain Lake in the Chuska Mountains on the New Mexico-Arizona border, there is a road that runs the length of the mountain chain. This was near Totalina in San Juan in New Mexico. My family would spend the summers in the mountains and help herd sheep. We had a cabin, corrals, tents, several other structures on the property, and occasionally would have some weird experiences with our animals. The dogs would bark at something unseen to us, and the sheep would run away from something hidden in the forest. We would just feel like something was watching us from the shadows. It was near dusk, and my family had just finished dinner and were socializing. I had been thumbing through a book when John came running in the shade house. We built next to the cabin, crying and white as a sheet. He was always the macho type that showed no emotion, though to see him this frightened almost alarmed my grandmother and my aunt and uncle to hurry out the front door. They stood at the threshold looking down at the direction of the well. I put the book down and walked to the door. They were all whispering in Navajo when I saw something down at the well. I first was excited because I thought it was a black bear. Then I noticed it was a grayish brown color and was kneeling. I've never heard of a bear that could kneel like a man. It looked as if it was washing something off or taking a drink. I had no problem with it until it looked over its shoulder at us and I could see its features. Man-like. That was all I needed to see. I ran into the cabin and hid in the bed under the covers. I was younger, and to this day, when I asked my mother about it, she says that everyone was in agreement that it was a Bigfoot. A few weeks later, it was standing outside of our tent about 2 a.m. I saw the shadow on the tent. As for the dog, they were not making a sound. Typically, when anything or anyone comes around, they howl and bark. There were no usual smells or sound. It never bothered us, but would come around occasionally. The witnesses were my grandmother, aunt, uncles, and several of my cousins. We were just finishing dinner. John had gone out to use the bathroom. On to the next one. At Sitting Bull Falls in Eddy County in New Mexico, Jean Bryant and Mike Waldrop were camping with their families when they heard a loud and horrifying scream and saw human-like creatures standing by a tree. In Arteza, in Eddy County, in New Mexico, Mari and Dean saw a several-foot-tall black Bigfoot with white eyes standing in an alley near her apartment. On to the next one. I was 14 years old, hunting deer with my father, grandfather, neighbor, and his son, who was the same age as me. The area we were hunting is called Mud Springs in Unit 5A. It is approximately 20 miles northwest of Lindrich, New Mexico. The area we hunted is bordered on three sides by the Jacrilla Indian Reservation. The terrain of the area is a long cliff buff on the west that leads down to several hills, knolls, and small canyons that dump out into big, open, flat lands to the east and north. There are several deer arroyos in the flat areas, 10 to 20 feet deep, that are not visible from the dirt roads that access the area. The eastern border of our hunting area is a group of gradual, sloping mountains. The best way for me to describe the area is like a huge box canyon, two miles wide 
five miles long, with the cliff buff at the eastern border and the gradual mountain at the western border, the flat dump out and slope downward toward the north, there is pretty much only one way in, a dirt road that comes in from the highway 595 from the northeast. There are several natural gas pumps, which look like oil wells, that run 24-7, and a quiet thump thump can be heard pretty much anywhere you are on the flat from the pump. The vegetation consists of sagebrush, four to five feet tall, on the flat, juniper trees on the hills and knolls, to ponderosas on the top of the cliff and mountaintops. We have seen deer, elk, bear, coyotes, squirrels, rabbits, and a few mountain lions in this area. It was late in the afternoon. My grandfather and I returned to the camper by truck from having a nearby knoll that overlooked a water hole. The camper was parked in an opening to the southern end of the Box Canyon with cliff to the west of it. The camper truck was in the spot where the nearest trees were 60 to 80 feet away on the northwest and south side of the camp. The east side of the camp faced the flat and the road. We were back a bit early. We usually stayed out till dark because we had not seen a thing all day or the day before. We did not expect my father, neighbor, or his son back after dusk. It was cold, November, so my grandfather and I stayed inside the camper. About a half an hour after arriving, my grandfather started dinner, so it would be ready when everyone else got back. Important note, my neighbor and their son had their own camper they were staying in, parked perpendicular to ours. The back door faced the center of camp where the fire pit was. My grandfather's truck was parked hood to hood with my dad, which had the camper on it. The tailgate of my grandfather's truck was facing the flat to the northeast, and the camper's back door was facing southwest. The hood of my neighbor's truck was facing southeast. Right around dusk, there was a loud bang on the side of the camper. I thought it was my dad, so I opened the back door of the camper and stepped down. I was young and excited, hoping someone had shot a deer. There was no one around. I was not scared, but thought my dad or neighbor's son was messing around with us. I walked around all the trucks, thinking he or they were hiding. Not the case. We never took truck or camper keys out into the field hunting, and kept them locked up while we were gone. We hid the keys under a rock, so whoever got back to camp first was able to get back into the camper or truck. My neighbor's camper was still locked up. I did not get the keys and check if they were inside. I just assumed they were not. I went back inside our camper. My grandfather, busy cooking hamburger helper, asked where they were. I told him I didn't know. He squeezed past me. I was in between the door and him and opened the door and started yelling at my dad. Something like, come on, you effers, dinner is almost done. I don't remember the exact dialogue, but it was in a raised voice, and my father was known for messing around with my grandfather, especially when my dad and neighbors were together. Big jokers that brought the best out of each other. My grandfather was easily irritated by their antics. No one answered my grandfather's ranting. He did not step out of the camper, but slammed the door shut, cuffing under his breath. We sat there, knowing they would be opening the door any minute. My grandfather was scooping out dinner and putting it on paper plates. We sat there waiting for them for over an hour. It was well past dark when I heard them coming up the road to camp. They were walking brisk, talking, not worried about making noise as hunting hours were long over. My father was smoking a cigarette. My neighbor and his son got their keys and went inside their camper to put away their rifles and change clothes. My dad walked up to me and asked if we had seen anything. I was next to the truck door where he was laying his rifle down on the seat. I told him no and then asked him where he went. He pointed toward the mountain to the east and said we were hunting up there. I said, no, where did you go after you came back here? He looked at me, puzzled, and said, We just got here. I blew it off and went back inside following him. My grandfather was irritated still 
and was chewing him out for messing with us since I had already eaten, and there's not much room in the camper. I climbed up on the cab over bed and laid on my stomach, watching and listening to my grandfather and father bicker about the banging incident. The argument stopped when my neighbor and his son came in. The son got up on the cab over bed with me and ate his cold dinner. We were propped up on our elbows, facing the adults who were sitting at the small table eating dinner. The banging incident did not get mentioned again. I don't think my neighbor or his son knew anything or heard anything about it. After they were done eating, discussion among the three adults was centered on whether we should stay another day or leave in the morning and get back home. It was a terrible hunt. We had not seen any deer. My neighbor's son and I wanted to make a campfire, but were told not to because it was too cold outside. It was late, and we might leave in the morning and did not want to leave a smoldering fire. All of a sudden, the banging, two distinct, hard bangs on the side of the camper happened again. All five of us were in the camper, and the bangs were definitely on the side of the camper. It was like somebody knocking, except it was more violent, like cops banging on the door before they break it in. It could not have been something falling on the roof or someone throwing something at the side of the camper. Startled, my dad, who was closest to the door, grabbed his three fifty seven Magnum that was in a drawer adjacent to the door and flung it open. He waited for about three seconds and then stepped out. There was no one out there. If it was a gentle knock, he wouldn't have grabbed the gun right away. He would have opened the door to see who was out there. Whoever banged on the camper would have had to clear sixty feet of open ground very quickly to get to the nearest tree line. I don't remember if it was a full moon, but it was bright enough to see a silhouette if there was one out there. By then, my neighbor was up and out the door behind my father. He went into his camper and got his pistol. My grandfather went out also, but did not have a weapon. I suppose my father thought someone was stalking our camp on foot. If a vehicle pulled up, we would have heard it and seen headlights long before it got to camp. He started talking loudly, like he was speaking to an audience, not yelling, warning whoever was out there that we were hunters with guns. He got no reply. My father is a rational man and is not quick to jump to the defensive. He did this time, so I knew something was wrong. The neighbor's son and I stayed in the camper after the adult walked around camp for about five minutes. My grandfather started a campfire. They stood out there for about ten minutes, talking quietly about what had happened. They came to the conclusion that it must have been a drunken hunter or something, so they were going to stay out there for a while to ward off whoever was messing around. My neighbor's son and I went out. All five of us sat around the fire, only whispering. Nothing happened for about an hour, so everyone eased up and we started talking normal again. I guess it was probably eight or nine o'clock at night when my father told us all to shut up. We all did and looked at him. He asked if we heard that. About the time my neighbor said, heard what? We all heard a screaming, moaning noise. There was about ten seconds of silence, and we heard it again. It went on for about fifteen minutes before my father, armed with his pistol, walked out of camp into the direction of the mountains to the east. Camp was situated toward the end of Box Canyon, so it was difficult to judge how far or which direction the screams were coming from. I followed my dad for about 100 yards down the road into the flat land. We stopped and stood in silence until we heard it again. At best, we could tell it was coming from up the tree line approximately 300 yards to the east across an arroyo at the foothills of the mountain. The screams came almost at regular intervals, 15 to 30 seconds apart. It almost sounded like it was coming from multiple locations, but it was difficult to tell because of echoing. We did not hear rustling or footsteps, but it was bright enough to see. If anything was moving in the open, we would have been able to make it out. We saw nothing. My dad decided to head in the direction we thought the screams were coming from. 
I stayed and watched him. He went across the arroyo and emerged about fifty yards from the edge of the tree line. By then, the screams ceased. I think whatever it was heard my dad coming. He was walking through sagebrush with no flashlight. My father started heading south, paralleling the tree line until I lost sight of him. I was starting to get more spooked than I was when I heard the screams. I guess because when the screams were happening, I could tell they were fairly far away. Now, I did not know where or how far it or they were. I walked quickly back to camp. My dad returned about 45 minutes later and reported that he did not see anything. We all stood around the fire for about an hour talking about the screams, and everyone came to the same conclusion, that it was not elk, coyotes, or any other animal we were all very familiar with in the woods of New Mexico. The rest of the night was uneventful. We all spent the next day hunting the area where we thought the screams came from, but no one saw anything out of the ordinary. My grandfather hunted the roads out of his truck. He could not hike around the mountains like the rest of us because of his age. There were no other hunters or camps in the area. We packed up and went home that afternoon. About a month or so later, my dad and I were watching in search of with Leonard Nimoy. They played some recordings of what were believed to be Bigfoot. It sent chills down my spine. I looked at my father, and it's like he just saw a ghost. They were the same screams we heard on the hunt, the same recordings I heard on the internet of Bigfoot, which has prompted me to write this. We returned to that area again the next year, and did hear the screams again, but they were much further away. Since then, we only hunted that area two more years because the state of New Mexico shut the entire area down to hunters because of poaching and the death of a rancher who tried to stop a poacher. The last time we were there, the Forest Service had gone in and thinned out a lot of wooded areas, and the natural gas pumps were not running. The area is now open for hunting, but by lottery draw only. We now hunt in the Gila. I cannot tell anyone that it was a Bigfoot because we did not see anything, but what we heard was not any animal that we are familiar with. I believe that it is completely possible that Bigfoot exists, and I think as our forests get smaller due to development, highway, homes, etc., we will eventually find one dead or alive. I think Bigfoot is a timid, shy creature that is very good at concealing itself, and there is probably very small numbers of them. It took the producers of the show Planet Earth on Discovery Channel three years to film 20 minutes worth of the only video images in existence of snow leopards in the wild. It stands to reason that it would be harder to video a creature whose numbers are probably much smaller than the leopard. Also, I think that the Bigfoot is much more intelligent than the leopard. My grandfather passed away many years ago, but my father will tell you the same story I just told you. My neighbor and his son would probably would also, but we lost contact quite a while ago. There was a strange lack of animals in the area. We did not see much of any animals, maybe a few rabbits and squirrels. Usually there was many deer and elk, but the famous cow mutilations were going on at the same time near this area. I don't believe they are related to my report. It was 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. on a cold, clear night with no wind. It was a full or almost full moon, bright enough to see. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much. And until next time, bye!